thereafter that he, dis that he distinguished himself as one of the great trial lawyers of our time. He gained fame by representing, among others, the Boston Strangler and Patty Hearst. He was also a key player in litigation involving the Korean Airlines Flight 007 and the Bhopal gas disaster. Along the way, Mr. Bailey authored many books, including The Defense Never Rests. More recently, he served as a commentator on the William Kennedy Smith trial. Please welcome Mr. F. Lee Bailey. Good evening. I uh, always return to Harvard with a bit of nostalgia, having been a member for a time of the class of 54 until it was decided that <clears throat> we were engaged in a police action in Korea, and if your grades were only gentlemen C's, as mine were in the early 50s, the draft was looking at you. Uh, always a rule beater, I sought to avoid the draft by enlisting in the Naval Flight Training Program, wound up getting shunted to the Marine Corps, and suddenly all of my objectives went at Harvard, which was to be <clears throat> a writer of some sort, preferably uh, a world-class novelist, were shattered because I got pushed into defending courts martial, not because I knew anything about it. They simply ran out of lawyers. The Marine Corps has always had a volunteer system that was non -parale. If your name began with A or B, you got volunteered for an awful lot of things. And uh, one day they said, you're a lawyer. Thank God they didn't run out of brain surgeons or, or something more sensitive. In any event, I, never, uh, I did find my way back here for a semester and a half. I spoke to the administration about getting waivers based on three years of experience and 104 trials in the Marine Corps. Could I go to law school without finishing the undergrad program? Um, Harvard said, no, we don't do that. Uh, BU said, sure, and off I went. <clears throat> and uh, compiled the worst attendance record in the history of Boston University School of Law. And there was a reason for that. I was told that if you want to do the street kind of lawyering that you seem to have enjoyed, you better not spend too much time in the halls of academe. You better get down in the courts where the action is happening and find out why it's happening, because you'll never learn how to try a lawsuit in law school. That was true in 1957, 8, 9, and 60, and it's still true today. There is not such a law school in the country. The dean used to call me in periodically and say, if you weren't the val valedictorian, I'd throw you out of this school. But uh, <clears throat> I somehow managed to hang in there. Uh, the only valedictorian ever to graduate without honors. I refused to join the law review. They abandoned the rule two years later, but I stood my ground. I said, I've learned more in court uh, than I could have by joining the law review. And if you don't want to give me honors, that's OK. Someday, if I make a lot of money, you'll come around for donation, and I'll say, be you who? And uh, I say it every year. <laughs> Don't ever think you ever get too old to enjoy saying, I told you so. No. <laughs> but the subject of tonight's discourse is not any of those things, nor am I here to brag about the fact that I have the only mother and brother who graduated from Harvard on the same day. She got her master's in education in 1966 at the age of 55 from this vaunted institution. He graduated this very law school on that day. <clears throat> she was jealous. She went on and got her PhD at the age of 70, just so none of us kids would think that we were hot stuff. Uh, my sister got angry. She has a master's in education from Harvard, went out and got an MBA somewhere, uh, and was going to enroll in law school this fall. And I said, Nancy, you should work. She got a good job, and thank God she's not going to overpopulate this already overpopulated profession, because at 55 she could be dangerous. Now, one of the things that was sacrilege in 1960 when I erupted on this rather conservative and in some ways sorry legal community, I mean, I offered an aerial picture into evidence one day and almost got held in contempt for a lack of precedent. Melvin Belli was doing it in California and getting kudos. The judges here didn't think that was right. I moved one day in Superior Court in a murder case that I'd be allowed to inspect the confession of my client. And the judge says, what, what's wrong with you? Ask your client what he told the police. You have no entitlement to the confession. These were dark ages. 
One of the things I thought would be helpful to the American public to understand that the average trial lawyer, alleged trial lawyer in America, really didn't know what he was doing, was to get a look at them. Instead of being content with the opinions and extrapolation and interpretations of the print media, many of whom didn't know whether a trial lawyer was any good or not, but that was the public's access, unless you were unemployed and had time to go to court. The only people that showed up at trials that were not on the front pages were retirees. They were court watch watchers. We got to know them all. They always had opinion as to how the case would go. Generally, they were wrong. But nobody knew what was happening. What was happening was that the average fellow who got out of law school, if he decided that he was a trial lawyer, was one. Now, this is very much like being a brain surgeon because you got out of medical school and decided that you were one. The medical profession had learned some years prior the specialization had become absolutely essential. The legal profession never paid any attention to the most telling prayer in all of literature, at least all that I have read, and that was a book by Lloyd Paul Stryker, published in, I think, 1950, called The Art of Advocacy, subtitled A Plea for the Division of the Trial Bar. And, of course, he was talking about the English system where if you really want to be an advocate, you get out of law school and then you go to another one for a while. And then you may be allowed in court, you don the wig, you make argument, you handle important cases. Solicitors aren't allowed in important cases in court. Barristers only, if you please. To the extent that that system smacks of elitism and royalty, one may criticize it. I can only tell you that if you have the time to go to England, go to a court, named the Old Bailey. I would like to tell you it was named after me. Actually, it uh, has several hundred years precedence. When I first went to England, I was asked to have my photograph taken on the steps of that most famous courthouse in the world, and the next day on the front page of the Daily Times, with typical British understatement, the photograph appeared and simply said, the young Bailey meets the old. But it was a good meeting, because the things that I had heard and read about our British colleagues and the excellence with which they pursue that which they are so very good at were true. I thought that if America could get a look firsthand, since television had become an accepted phenomenon, it was even being shown in color by the early 60s, quite a departure from the fledgling days when Ed Sullivan ruled the roost in the late 40s with the uh, newcomers like Elvis Presley, that it would benefit everybody if a look could be had. I do not recall anyone who was in agreement with that, and certainly the American Bar Association was in total disagreement. In 1960, only two states allowed any kind of visual media in a courtroom. They were Texas and Colorado, and they were like Massachusetts, which allowed questions by counsel on voir dire, but the judges of the Superior Court made very, very sure that that never happened. Probably through some sort of conspiracy or other, I will simply tell you it never happened. A jury was put in the box in those days if they were all unrelated to the defendant, which was a problem on Nantucket, but not elsewhere. If it was a murder case or very highly publicized, five questions were put by statute, all of which said, can you be fair? And your answer better be yes. And it always was, or almost always. That was voir dire. The American Bar Association said, and I think today the only one that would sally forth and, and try to support these rather silly statements would be Chief Justice Warren Burger, because he, as long as he was in office, would never permit the television cameras to broadcast even his state of the judiciary address, which he made once a year. He absolutely hated them. Indeed, I saw a quote from him saying that the William Kennedy Smith trial was an insult to America because it was put on television. But that has to be put down as a fetish. The reason that the ABA said this is a bad deal is that the following things will happen. Now, most of you, if you had any smattering of evidence so far uh, in these wonderful halls, have heard that mere speculation is not admissible. We try to keep that out of trials and get more definitive statements that are likely to be related to some fact somewhere than mere speculation. The ABA, which had absolutely no experience with televising trials, had this to say. First, the lawyers will become hams. They will forget their duties and be so concerned about the big eye in the courtroom that they will be performing from 9 until 5, and the trials 
will be denigrated accordingly. The judges, particularly in those jurisdictions where they are elected rather than anointed for life, uh, will also become hams having in mind the fact that by their votes shall ye know them, because if they don't have enough, ye shall not know them anymore. The witnesses will become distracted, and the jurors will be peering at the cameras like you see at sporting events when some turkey realizes that the big eye has pointed at him and wants his whole family to know he's been at the Red Sox game, even though it was upside down by 10 runs, he was there. These were the reasons, said the denizens of the American bar, that we should never permit this travesty. I suppose the real reason was that they might not have wanted the public to get an honest look at what they were doing in the courtrooms in America, knowing full well that the average member of the public unless he or she were out of work, had no opportunity to do that, except if they were involved in litigation. And then the horror stories they would tell about what the lawyers did should be forever uncorroborated. Little by little in the 70s, the late 70s, the rule, the might of the ABA was eroded. Florida, where I uh, had the distinct pleasure of boning up for the bar after practicing 30 years, you really do want to go after you've been out for a while, back and take another look at the rule in Shelley's case. It's very important. Uh, for the Maldi State, for future interests, the fact that only South Carolina even remembers what the rule in Shelley's case was all about or enforces it to any degree is irrelevant. Uh, the bar examiners feel in their multiple guest questions. I mean, when I went to law school, every professor agreed that any professor who ever used a multiple choice exam in order to avoid the work of reading the students Writings was obscene. There was no question about it. Now that, of course, too, has eroded, as you will learn when you go to take the bar exam. Uh, and you can either finish Harvard or you can forget Harvard and go to Barbara. You'll pass the exam in either event if you're bright. You have to learn three things. And number one, it's a test of reading and comprehension. Number two, it's a test of eliminating three wrong answers. The fourth will be the correct one. And number three, studying law helps, but is not essential. Indeed, to prove the point one day, Bob Wright put a student through its course without ever having gone to law school, and the student passed the exam. Uh, several felonies were involved in that exercise, and it became a Mexican standoff, and has not been further publicized, but if you've had dinner with everybody who teaches uh, for Bob Wright, and I have, uh, you'll learn that, yes, it really did happen. We began to put the big eye in the courtroom on an experimental basis. Every state said, what we'll do is we'll put in a cutoff so that if nobody really likes the deal, we don't have to vote against it. We'll let it expire like a patient that we don't want around anymore. Just pull the plug. You don't have to kill him. Let him expire. But they didn't mind it all that much. They put one camera in. It was a pool camera. If everybody else wanted a picture, they could draw on that feed and broadcast it and edit it and do anything they wanted. And the public began to get a look, only in trials that were of great importance because the stations didn't send people in to watch the average run of the null trial. Indeed, that has only happened recently with the advent of the American lawyer sponsored, but the Times Warner bankroll, believe me, is going to be around for a while, Court TV, which uh, if you have the right cable company in this uh, area, you can get. Of course, being Harvard Law students, you have no time for anything, including watching court TV. But it is a good opportunity to see lawyers, not superstars, sometimes not terribly distinguished, in action doing what is supposed to be the ultimate in the practice of law, and that is the resolution of disputes that cannot be solved in any other way. Got to try them out and let a jury decide. The most anomalous procedure that could ever be devised with only one saving grace. Jurors, in their collective wisdom, usually have some. Every other culture that uses the Anglo-American system of jurisprudence has abandoned juries except in two cases. One, criminal cases, and two, cases of libel. Otherwise, you don't get a jury trial. The judges are better and more predictable, and that's what settles cases. That is what makes the law livable, the ability to predict what will happen if a controversy goes to the map, and therefore don't take it there. We can sit down and compromise it in a way that makes us all happy. The unevenness of the procedural differences from jurisdiction to jurisdiction 
in the United States is often cited as troublesome. Believe me, it is not. I have been in court in every jurisdiction in this country, except the state of Montana, and I went there once, but I couldn't find anybody, and not anyone who was in trouble. Uh, Evil Knievel was there, but he was in trouble in California, not Montana. And the variation is greater from judge to judge than it is from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. As an overview, if you are charged with a crime and you are innocent, you should be first in military court, then in state court, and avoid at all costs federal court, where your innocence may be quite irrelevant. Indeed, that issue has just been pumped up to the Supreme Court. May we not execute this person, even though he's innocent, because it's legally irrelevant in appeal. That is the law, by the way. It's not pleasing, but it is the law. The only place where innocence carries any price at all once you leave the trial level is the military. And it carries a pretty good price there because the military can't afford this kind of nonsense. Morale is what moves armies. Morale and food, not procedural niceties and due process of law. You convict one innocent soldier, the whole barracks will know that you've made a mistake and they'll decide right then and there neither to fight nor re-up. So they have to run a little classier ship. What is the public seeing? Well, they weren't seeing very much, at least not on any kind of gross basis. People would see smatterings in news reports. Nobody was giving any block-to-block coverage. Why not? Television is a voracious medium. It has an audience with an average IQ of somewhere around 102 that must be entertained, and most commercials are thought to be more entertaining than most trials. So who the hell is going to watch a trial unless it was a really hot potato? And then all you would get to see, are they going to interrupt the days of our lives, regular programming, for an hour of cross-examination? Oh, no, of course not. The people who are watching television would never put up with that. They would rather watch L.A. Law, Perry Mason, or Anatomy of a Murder, which was a real trial and really one of the few that hewed rather closely to the way things really are. But now suddenly there burst upon the scene two things, and now three in rapid succession, which is giving a new look and one that I hope that you people will consider at some length. Because operating under public scrutiny is something that lawyers have managed to avoid for years and years, along with the doctors who do not invite NBC into the operating room. If somebody says, hey, this poor bastard's going to die, and another one says, let him, as long as no recording is going, that's not the kind of evidence that shows up in a malpractice suit, even though circulating nurses may hear it oh, more often than you'd like to think. <clears throat> First of all, it turned out that the fix was in, in an important matter to the United States. At least one could argue that any time a Supreme Court justice is being considered for confirmation, that is an important matter. The Democrats and the Republicans got together, the same group who never guilty of any conspiracies of any kind, and said, look, we got this affidavit from this Hill woman, let's bury it. And that was agreed upon until somebody leaked to Nina Totenberg, whom I have known since she was just a small and ambitious young radio reporter, uh, and is now not much bigger, but a very distinguished radio reporter, and she put the word out immediately. This woman says that his conduct, although not rape or anything close to it, was judicially unbecoming. If you want to be the, the judge of the highest court in the land, you ought to have to answer for that. And lo and behold, we had the new Senate hearings. Now understand, these were rigged. They were rigged to this extent. Justice Thomas had one approval absent the Hill matter to the U.S. Supreme Court. That was a fait accompli, and the majority would have been substantial. The Democrats had signed on to that and signed on to the notion that the Hill matter would not surface. Why do you think they are spending so much time and money making fools of themselves trying to chase down the leak? If they ever get Nina Totenberg in a corner, I will grab the whole defense bar of the United States and go in and beat them off. They are never going to find out who did that leak, although they will suspect forever Senators Kennedy and Metzenbaum and anybody else that is thought to be too liberal to be part of the current era of government. The senators demonstrated the fact that the case was fixed by not calling upon a single professional to come in and cross-examine 
the two principles. There is not a cross-examiner in the Senate anywhere. I looked very carefully by reading every word of the transcript of those hearings as a result of a request by the American Bar Association, my friend, suddenly, to do an article on the competence of the cross-examination of the senators who did not seek outside help but jumped in. Now, this is an oxymoron. Competence of senators to cross-examine. There is no such thing. The closest we ever came to that in these hearings was Howell Heflin, who used to be a pretty competent plaintiff's lawyer many, many years ago, before he got on the Supreme Court, where cross-examination is limited to a few generally polite questions to counsel who are down at the dais, and uh, not much more. <clears throat> Certainly, one does not stay in fighting trim on the Supreme Court of Alabama or in the Senate of the United States. The result was everybody was unhappy. The right questions were never asked. The posturing was obscene. Everybody was trying to get reelected, apparently, right in the middle of the hearings. But one thing was sure, the result could not be different. Because had it turned out that Justice Thomas did not get real, uh, did not get confirmed after the Hill hearings, the Democrats were going to have to pay the price. The Republicans could not have been expected to spike their own boy. The opposition was entrusted to spike him if he needed spiking, and they had fixed the case. And so he did get confirmed, 52 to 48. That's bad news for everybody, including Justice Thomas and Anita Hill. He carries a cloud that he might or might not deserve. She carries doubt about her accusations because they were stale that she might or might not deserve. She may indeed be a heroine of sorts. We'll never know because the process failed. Astute counsel should have been able to break one or the other of them and leave us with a definitive result. But everybody saw it, and everybody was dissatisfied for reasons they may not have understood, like the Magi of old, all unsatisfied. Next came a trial that was a non-trial, an event that was a non-event except for the name Kennedy. Years ago, and none of you will remember this, when the Kennedy dynasty was born, I mean, Jack got elected by seven votes in Chicago, which are still in question. Bobby became attorney general because Joe said he had to be. And Teddy got put up at the ripe old age of 30 to be a senator. And people began to say enough is enough. One of those who said that was Edward McCormick, the nephew of Speaker McCormick of the House, the Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, a man of certain accomplishments. And he said in the course of his campaign, and it backfired and it cost him the nomination, all agree. He said in a debate with Senator Kennedy, if your name were Edward Moore instead of Edward Moore Kennedy, your candidacy would be a joke. That was true. That was true. It would have been a joke if his name was Edward Moore, just as we elected a state treasurer named John Kennedy. Not John Fitzgerald Kennedy, John Francis. So far as anybody could ever tell, he wasn't qualified for anything, and it didn't make any difference. His name was on the ballot, and it said John F., and he became the treasurer of the Commonwealth. I don't know what happened to our money, but I know we didn't have any for years in this Commonwealth. McCormick got licked. Senator Kennedy became a senator and then began to earn his spurs and managed to get reelected over and over again in one of the most tumultuous family histories that has ever been spread on any kingdom, in any culture, anywhere and no one will probably ever sort it out. But had William Smith been just William Smith? I don't think that a pickup after midnight at the O Bar, which is a very non-remarkable bar in my hometown of Palm Beach, would have caught anyone's attention, except that you put the name Kennedy into it, and all of a sudden the press is inspired to write a womanizing, drinking, carousing, and other conduct of a questionable nature. Now, they kept firing at William Smith. People don't usually become famous because of their middle names. I never saw the name William Smith in any article. It was always William Kennedy Smith. But they were shooting at his uncle, 
whose heritage in this commonwealth, until the prosecution was dumb enough to put him on the stand and lionize him unwittingly, uh, was plummeting very badly. It reminds me a little bit of the defense of Jean Harris. You may remember Jean Harris was the dean of a prominent woman's school who had an affair with the architect of the Scarsdale Diet, Dr. Herman Tarnow. And uh, Dr. Tarnower, after an encounter with Jean Harris, wherein a discussion was had about the fact that uh, Tarnower had taken on a new and, and younger paramour, uh, he wound up very dead. Uh, and she was tried for that. And the defense, as I understood it, it wasn't terribly clear, was that she was so depressed she had gathered her pistol to her bosom and gone to the home of Dr. Tarnower to evince her utter distress and to suicide herself in his presence so he could appreciate the evil of what he had done by dumping her in favor uh, of a younger and more supple woman. And that in the process of this exercise, she fired the pistol four times trying to suicide herself, and four times she missed and hit Dr. Tarnower and uh, wound up being, being tried for his homicide. Well, the press kept shooting at William Kennedy Smith, whom nobody knew from Adam, and hitting Teddy. And that was good news because it got a huge audience. The notion was then spread around that a fair trial could not be had in Palm Beach County. First, understand some. The acquittal rate in criminal cases that are tried across the United States generally ranges from something in the 20% area on an averaging in state prosecutions to 10% or less in federal prosecutions and probably less than that in military prosecutions, simply because the military weeds people out and does not have as many politically inspired proceedings. By my own research, which is fairly extensive in this area, the acquittal rate in highly publicized, supposedly prejudicial cases that I have tried was over 80 percent. So the tables were turned. Nobody hated William Kennedy Smith. Indeed, in Palm Beach, we kind of liked the family. Nobody thought that this was uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, a monster that had to be restrained at all costs, that should be convicted whether he was guilty or innocent. It was a curiosity. How did this happen? Why was this person there? What happened to the pantyhose? All those intriguing questions. The trial of the century, it was called. I agreed to do a play-by-play -play for uh, court TV simply because Steve Brill and I go back quite a way to the days when everybody thought he was a joke and would never succeed. I'm sure, like Liberace, he has cried all the way to the bank over those kinds of criticisms on more than one occasion. But court TV is a good idea. I hope it succeeds, and I'm pleased to support it. And this was a trial I thought that might give the American public, if it were explained as it went along, as best a trial lawyer can do that, some insight into what our procedures are really all about and where they are deficient in why. It turned out to be an embarrassment. First of all, it was not a level playing field. Most people would never have taken a case with this many flaws in it to trial. What you don't learn in law school is that David Bloodworth, the state attorney in Palm Beach County, was so pilloried for favoring the Kennedys when David Kennedy overdosed on heroin or whatever it was he was taking some years ago in Palm Beach not ordering an autopsy, not ordering a, a full-scale investigation, that the Palm Beach Post went after his scalp, and they have never stopped. And in this case, he may have overreacted. Second problem, they left the investigation in the hands of the police in Palm Beach County. Now, the police in Palm Beach County do only one thing. They pinch you if you drive over 35. The average person in Palm Beach County is 107. And if they drive over 35, they kill everybody, including themselves. So you don't drive over 35. I am the youngest people in the, in, in, one of the youngest people in the community, uh, I assure you. And I restrain myself to 35. We don't have any rape in Palm Beach County. We had three cases last year. One was dismissed by the cops as silly. One was dismissed by the victim as a mistake. And the other was William Kennedy Smith, which became a full-blown trial. It was overkill, such as you'll never see. How many indigent defendants do you think could have put on such a wonderful defense? On how many indigent defendants do you think the state would have spent the kind of money it spent on experts? I mean, a doctor who gets $100 an hour to look at you gets 350 an hour to talk about something in which he's not even an expert. 
obviously he is available. I watch the experts in amazement, and I have called more than my share. Dr. Henry Lee from Connecticut, a distinguished forensic pathologist, a true detective, a brilliant man is called for what reason? He gives opinion that if a woman running for her life across a lawn is tackled by a guy who's 6'3 and 190 pounds on the move, she'll get grass stains somewhere. They brought him from Connecticut for that, on her clothes, on her body, or somewhere. The pinnacle of expertise, of course, was Dr. Raphael Good. Now, credentials are all important in expert testimony. What was Dr. Good? Dr. Good was a double-barreled shotgun. At age 70, and I don't denigrate his age, as I say, my mother got her Ph.D. at 70, and 83, she is still very dangerous. Um, at age 70, he had managed to get board certified in OBGYN and psychiatry and neurology. By combining the collective wisdom of these sciences, he was able to give this opinion to an American jury. If an unaroused male attempts to penetrate a dry and unaroused female who is on the move, he's going to have trouble. That's what he said. That was his opinion. And the jurors went, wow. You wonder whether they'd ever heard that before. In any event, any time in this day and age when the community is becoming much more sensitive, as it should have a long time ago, because when I was a young lawyer, if you got raped and you didn't have any bruises or any badly ripped clothing or any marks from a weapon, the chance of your getting the police to vindicate your rights were not very good unless you claim that your psychiatrist raped you and they had a bucket full of complaints on the same guy. You were out of luck. No witnesses, no case. That has turned around. One-on-one -on -one is now a feasible case, as we learned in Indiana. But it has to carry some credentials with it or it should not be brought into a courtroom. Gigantic flaws in any proceeding, particularly when the standard is beyond a reasonable doubt, cannot be ignored. And in this case, they were. First, although it's a relatively new phenomenon, pantyhose is a different kind of defense than ever existed when I was a youngster. The Irish of South Boston, where Willie Smith was brought up, learned that a decent woman would say no at least five times, and you had to gauge by the tenor of her voice whether she really meant it, but she would never say yes, so you, you kept asking. Second, pantyhose are the last bastion of defense, and if they are removed, the manner in which they are removed can be very decisive in any claim of sexual assault. Third. When you get tackled on a lawn and you don't have any grass stains, your story is not credible. Fourth, when you say, I was screaming at the top of my lungs in the nosiest neighborhood in all of Palm Beach that watches the Kennedys in shifts to see if anything's happening over there, didn't hear a word, nor did any family member. I mean, they never have a gathering of less than a hundred, including a former FBI agent and two New York state prosecutors with open windows, never heard a peep. That isn't very good, and when you keep telling the defendant, I think you're Michael, show me your ID again, there is good reason to believe that reality is not part of the picture. Any one of those four factors would have been a whale of a hole through which to march a defendant in a rape case anywhere in the United States. As I said to Roy Black, why did you waste all that evidence in one case? You could have won three others by saving some of them. Compounding that offense. And this all of America got to watch for better or for worse. One of the most inept prosecutors ever to stand up in an American courtroom absolutely butchered the case. And please make no mistake, I do not think Clarence Darrow with Edward Bennett Williams at his side could have won it. Evidence is what wins cases, not pyrotechnics by glib counsel who happen to have a better command of the English language than their colleagues or are faster on their feet would not have been one. The jury might have stayed out a little long. But to say silly things like, when are you some kind of sex machine? I mean, this is not cross-examination. Or you want the jury to believe you can do it twice in 30 minutes? This is not attacking credibility. Kids in his 20s, for goodness sakes. These are mistakes that a sensible prosecutor shouldn't make. 
to put Ted Kennedy on the stand for no discernible purpose except to have him almost break down in tears over the very genuine loss of his brother-in-law, with whom he was very close, and then hand him over to the defense, where a very well-schooled, highly professional, and well-trained, bright lawyer only asked one question, tell us again how it felt when your brother-in-law died. And he couldn't. Probably raised his popularity in Massachusetts back over the 50% point in that event alone. But that wasn't enough. The worst mistake I've ever seen a prosecutor pull in my life was to ask William Kennedy Smith, who had a good story to which they never had access because they foreclosed the possibility that he could talk his way out of this problem. They made it known you're going to get prosecuted no matter what you have going for you because that's the way it is, so they never got any access, no chance to tie him down, unlike Mike Tyson, who went before the grand jury in a desperate attempt to shove this case aside before it got a, a real bite at his career. This question was put, and I can't imagine that it was ever thought through. It was simply petulant arguing with the witness, and a good example to prove my point that if we don't train trial lawyers in America, we can't expect to get any good ones except the accidental candidates who happen because they do it for themselves. You know, nobody taught the right players how to fly, but nobody's advocating that you go out and learn on your own tomorrow, not if you want to live very long. You go get a flight instructor to train you to do that. We don't do that in advocacy. Consider this question. Do you want this jury to believe that you had consensual sex on the lawn in your mother's home when her window was open. And the defense answer, you remember that question, ladies and gentlemen, she wants the jury to believe that he had violent sex on a screaming woman in his mother's home when the window was open and a prosecutor and another prosecutor and a former FBI agent were easily within range, as were many other people. That probably did more to produce a rapid-fire thumping verdict than any other development in the case, at least if you listen to reports of the juror. Now, what happened as a result of that case? Sure, it was lopsided. Sure, the counsel were far from well-matched. And if the blue blob in front of Patty Bowman's face made her credible when she peeled it off and went head-to-head -head with Diane Sawyer, who did cross-examine her. Roy Black laid off of her, very frankly, for a good strategic reason. Who did cross-examine her, her sympathy factor didn't rise. It fell. Her answers were no better, perhaps worse, than they had been at trial. Everybody saw it all. I didn't get any lashback in that case that women were unfairly treated, as was the case in Anita Hill's experience in Capitol Hill, that the result was wrong or anything close to that. People who wanted to see could watch at night on reruns, both CNN and Court TV had them for the benefit of the people who were employed. There are still people in this country who are employed. I hope that you are when you graduate, if things improve. <clears throat> And they were not dissatisfied. What happened in the Tyson case? How the hell do you know? Indiana, which is only videotaped, to my knowledge, one trial in history, and that was in 1971, when the law school videotaped a murder trial that I conducted about an Air Force major who came home one night and found God sitting in the mantelpiece saying, go slaughter your wife immediately. Being a good Christian, he did. And then we had to explain that to not one jury, but two, hung jury, finally an acquittal, it has only been seen by the Indiana Law School. It is restricted, like the Titicut Follies in Massachusetts, for certain purposes not to include public viewing. Indiana simply decided it was better off. Now a minority of states, if the public did not get a look at what was really going along, unless it wanted to stand in line for one of the few seats not occupied by the press, and who really has time for that, and even if you did, could you stand in line every day and watch it all? I would not have made any commentary for anybody, NBC, CBS, or Court TV in the Smith case, except my condition was met, I must watch every single thing that occurs in the presence of the jury. Bench conferences, I can figure out what the jury sees, I want to see before I give any opinion as to why a lawyer may or may not have done 
or a judge may or may not have ruled, as you have seen occur. All we had in the Tyson trial is what we used to have when I began to practice, and that is a non-lawyer's opinion of the impact of a witness as expressed in the print media after it has passed editing to make sure that it's interesting. Cross-examination has never, 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 in my view, been adequately reproduced, except in the most obvious cases in the print media. It is a moment-to-moment -moment dynamic event where the slightest non-articulated response can change the day. People saying, my name is Joe, can be disbelieved immediately because of the way that they say it or the tenor or the timber or the quake in their voice. This is what credibility is all about. We don't let people who don't see the witnesses make any important judgments about those witnesses. But if we do know that they saw the witnesses and they are called jurors, they make judgments that are totally unreviewable. And if you haven't been told so far, please understand. There is absolutely no legal machinery, except in military court, to correct a jury mistake. Nor is there any way to find out how it was made. What is said in the jury room is off limits, absent two kinds of errors which are cognizable. Number one, a juror brings expertise into the jury room that did not come out in the trial because of his or her background, or a juror threatens another juror to the point where coercion can be shown. If they simply act foolishly or believe the wrong witnesses, that's tough. That's why Americans do permit innocent people to be executed, because if the jury's verdict must be undisturbed is more important than that it be correct. How do we know whether it was correct? The evidence in the Tyson case, depending on which version you were reading, seemed to seesaw. You had a pristine, unimpeachable young woman who was under the most strange circumstances, if you believed all of the government's evidence, observing this completely unshackled sex maniac touching everything in sight at a beauty contest. A hands-on person, you could say. And then in Indianapolis, where it, one could take judicial notice that the streets roll up at 7 o'clock. You can't even watch the haircuts after 7.30 on most nights. To take your camera to a hotel room at 1.30 in the morning, expecting to go sightseeing without a flash. Now, this could have gone either way. There were very good lawyers on both sides. One I've known personally for 30 years, the other I'll know only by reputation, but among his colleagues. And he deserves uh, the accolades that he has gotten. He's a good prosecutor. And he had a fairly strong case. Second, if you should be charged with a crime in Indiana, you should. You should immediately drag the body or the corpus delecti, or whatever it is that's important to the crime, across a state line in any direction, because you'll probably get a better trial. Now, I have, I have some of my best friends are from Indiana. I shouldn't say that a couple of them are. But uh, it's a tough city. So incidentally, it's Cincinnati and Phoenix. Please don't get into trouble there, because I may or may not be able to help you get out, but I will certainly double the fee just for being there. Much better off in West Palm Beach, where we have a fairly cosmopolitan, although not totally, community that is likely to take the longer look. And I don't imply for one minute, because I simply don't know, and you don't know, and you never will, whether the result in Indiana was correct or skewed, or whether a juror really did say, look, we were under terrible pressure, the world was watching us. We couldn't let the women lose a third one. These are the kinds of vagaries that ought to chill your bones. You have a good case, you've prepared it well, you either try it yourself or hire somebody who's good, and then a flaw like that crops up, some juror saying the world is watching us. If that case had been televised, we would have a good sense as to whether or not the right thing was done. What really has happened with the big eye in the courtroom is Number one, the lawyers do not preen. They perform better. They know that they're going to be watched by a lot of people. They come to court better prepared. They handle themselves in a better way than I had seen them do in days before the camera was present. And I think generally their clients 
are better represented. The judges are more fair, less apt to be brusque, equestrian. That's what we call a judge who thinks he's a horse and rides all over everybody in the courtroom. They stay awake. In the Hearst case, the judge, like many of us, and believe me, this is something you're going to have to learn. You go out and have lunch, if you have lunch, your metabolism will draw the blood from your brain to your stomach to aid the digestive process. You will feel drowsy. A two o'clock witness is often not heard, or at least not absorbed. And everybody feels a little bit naughty, and sometimes the members of the judiciary. In, in the Hearst case, uh, the judge nodded off frequently. He had a problem. He did not have enough blood to the brain because he was ill and had an operation the day before the trial to try and cure the problem. It was not successful. He just, frankly, couldn't stay awake. He was asked not to try the case by his colleagues, uh, and it killed him. He died a month after the verdict came in before even sentence could be pronounced. But one day, he was clearly nodding off, and I said to the prosecutor's name was Steele Langford, I said, Steele, take a look at the bench. Carter still fell asleep every day at two o'clock. I don't think he would have done it if his family was videotaping him so they could show it to him that night and see how it looked. Most important, the witnesses. I mean, if you're going to tell a lie with 10 people in the courtroom and you're fairly well practiced on how you're going to do it, it's not such a risky experience. But if you're going to tell a lie, particularly about a highly publicized event with three million viewers out there, more than one of whom may know better, and call counsel immediately, and they do, you better watch out. The witnesses pulled tight and are much more conservative, and please take my word for this, than ever they have been when they operate without that kind of scrutiny. The jurors are seen in some states, they're not seen in others. I don't think it makes much difference. In Florida, they can be seen. They don't pay any attention to that one camera in the back of the room that never moves and never makes a sound. But recording the things that judges tell juries are important to the adjudication of critical human rights, and that is the credibility of witnesses and the inferences that can be drawn from that part of their testimony that one does accept, of the dynamics that are never, never found in a trial transcript and never available to an appellate court even when life is at stake, except as they may have been video courted in the course of the proceedings. There is no downside that I have ever seen to this procedure. There is a serious downside to wondering based on conflicting, and they are certainly in the Tyson case, news reports as to what happened there, whether or not justice was done. After all, <clears throat> different stories were told. Only one can be true. My experience is neither one is true. They both stray from the baseline. People have honest recollections that are distant from what a fly would have seen in the wall or a camera would have recorded for a whole host of psychological reasons, and then they depart further sometimes and tell deliberate lies for one reason or another. But whether or not consent could fairly have been inferred that night in that hotel room, we will never know. We will only know what that jury saw fit to say about that, maybe understanding or maybe not understanding that brutal though it seems, rape is a crime that never occurs to a woman. It occurs, if at all, only in the mind of the male. Now, people don't like to hear that, but you learned it in your criminal law without intent. An honest mistake in thinking one had consent simply isn't rape. It may be enough to support a substantial civil judgment, but it is not a criminal offense. And to sort out this kind of nicety is always delicate for any finder of fact and always subject to the possibility that an emotional reaction, particularly when you've got a gorgeous young victim and a rather brutalistic person, and after all, what is a professional pugilist? He's expected to brutalistic. You don't get to be the heavyweight champion of the world at 25 by dancing on your fancy tiptoes, uh, not at least since Muhammad Ali. Tough guy. 
Not a good witness, in all probability, committed wisely or otherwise at an early stage of the proceedings to a story and thus vulnerable to attack. If he was convicted properly, then that is justice. If he wasn't, an important sports career has been cut off and he might have been wrongfully convicted, and this is the irony of it, even though the female victim honestly believed every single word of her own story. Because if she believed what she said, and he believed what he said, acquittal would have been mandatory. It was just a bad case not to have access to, but it's over and done with. And hopefully the public will take note of the fact that they are, like the Magi, all unsatisfied. There is much controversy in every community, and I've been in a bunch since the verdict came in, about whether this was the right or wrong result, about whether the victim should be on television with or without fees, talking about the matter, etc. There is no unanimity and no satisfaction that our process worked. Whether or not there would have been with direct access to the proceedings we don't know, but there might have been, and that would make it worth trying to reshape Indiana's thinking and making her understand that if she runs a good courtroom, there's no reason in the world that people shouldn't be able to see it firsthand, not second and third hand. Food for thought. You'll learn that the medical profession changes its stripes very, very carefully, particularly since they're worried about us suing them for doing anything new. The legal profession changes its stripes even more reluctantly, because at the end of the day, like the speculators from the ABA who thought the television camera would rip up American justice and leave it in shreds on the sidewalk, with no hard evidence, just the wisdom of their own uninformed speculation. We often avoid doing the things which to the average Martian might seem fairly obvious if he had recently arrived and not been tainted in his thinking by my law school or yours. Thank you very much. I'm given to understand that nothing has changed since I first lectured at the, this hallowed institution in the early 60s and that the price of having the podium to yourself for a while is that you must jump into the crucible of cross-examination for all of those who would sally for it. W would anybody like to put a question? Uh, you need not preface it with the caveat, you don't have to answer this, but uh, if it's anywhere within the realm of reason, uh, I, I will be glad to try to answer it. If it is a polemic statement, I will cut you off halfway through. We're here only for questions. Uh, and if it is silly, we'll simply pass on to the next. But I don't expect that problem in this audience. Does anybody have a, a question, no matter uh, how virulent, with which to test the assertions of counsel? Yes. It's very important, I think, to be able to second guess any institution which, like the U.S. Supreme Court, is not final because it's infallible. It's infallible because it's final, and that describes an American jury. If there were a huge groundswell of public opinion by those who would watch the case that this was a skewed result, it would have some benefit somewhere down the line. It might or might not affect the outcome of my Tyson's ordeal, if that's what it is, at least until the appellate process was over. It might have affected uh, any executive clemency he might have gotten. But <clears throat> appreciating, as I do, your remark, what would the downside have been with respect to the jury's verdict if we'd all gotten a look at it?
Well, speak what they are, because I'd like to hear them. I've been doing this for 30 years and I haven't heard a good one yet. That's a hell of a lot better than having some reporter tell you what he thinks I said. They can't go to that place. They can't get in. This is not an amphitheater. that the judge who went to uh, vacationing in the Caribbean during the jury's deliberations uh, uh, made a serious misjudgment. I think that's been called to his attention. Uh, I think the partial verdict which was rendered in Attica may well have been supported by the evidence. Treatment of prisoners tends to be brutal and in uprisings even more brutal, although sometimes it seems well warranted by the things that they do. But very frankly, as in Tyson, why in the world should I give opinion on something I've only read about in the newspapers? It would be of no value to anybody, including myself. Uh, I, I'm asked, well, what about the Dahmer opinion? I said, well, I mean, verdict. Uh, I don't know what happened in Dahmer's case. I read that all the psychiatrists disagreed. They always do. But I did forecast, that long before the jury was picked, that he will be convicted no matter what the evidence, because no jury ever wants to contemplate his being released ever again. And they don't believe in medicine when it comes to locking people up. They believe in prisons. Jerry came out of the Boston Strangler trial and said, hey, me, he may be nuts, but they let him out once before, and we're not going to give him that chance again. And that's what happened to Dharma. I mean, to say that a, people, a fellow like Jeffrey Dharma, who cuts people up and cannibalizes them, is not crazy, is stretching a bit, I think. What they really mean is, he shouldn't be out. And I agree with that. He shouldn't be out, for his sake and ours. Any other questions, sir? <clears throat> there is no official videotaping in any court that I know of. Whether or not one could use, and there, there was a great deal of videotaping by the TV stations that cover the trials, even though most of the footage of the average trial is never broadcast. They tend to keep the reels for a while. Whether an appellate court might uh, want to call upon that? I rather doubt, because I don't know of any appellate courts that have any jurisdiction to review credibility except in the military where the convening authority can uh, supervene any judgment, fact or law, or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts where in a capital case, first degree murder, not capital anymore, first degree murder, life no parole, they have a discretionary power to reject testimony, and they might well call for it, but I've never heard of it being done. I have never heard of them calling for that which is official in many courts, and that is a contemporaneous audio recording as the stenographer with her stenotype is taking down in mechanical shorthand now, not many, not many manual shorthand reporters still in courts in this country. Uh, a, a, a recorder sometimes with five channels, so there's a microphone in front of every player, is also taking down part of what's going on. But frankly, the cues that one gets as to lying are not uh, audible cues most of the time. They are visual cues. People that turn beet red, uh, people that look at the floor while declaring their innocence and things like that are giving very strong signals as to what they're really trying to express 
Those don't show up on audio tapes. I, I would think in the future it will be de rigueur that the court, not the media, will make a video recording and not on tape. It will be on a compact disc and hold 800 trials uh, and, and be scanned immediately for any witness testimony with a bar counter. <clears throat> Modern technology is already there simply to have that available, and I would think in every capital case, real capital case, the whole thing ought to be preserved. Because when you come up against a question as has now been accepted by the U.S. Supreme Court, can we execute a person despite a possibility of innocence, unexplored? If we give him enough due process, have we got the right to kill him because of his ceremonial benefits? even though we came to the wrong result. The silliest goddamn thing I've ever heard in my life. The U.S. Supreme Court is going to hear arguments on that. I used to love to taunt federal judges in habeas corpus proceedings. Say, Your Honor, you do have some jurisdiction over whether or not the state raped this man's rights, but should you come to the conclusion that he is innocent, you are powerless to do anything about it. And they would practically crawl off the bench. And who do you think you're talking to? Now, whenever you tell a federal judge he's powerless about anything, you have bitten the tiger in the middle of the tail, and sometimes that's a good way to get him to act. That very issue is finally going up to the worst Supreme Court in my lifetime. I'm not, not at all optimistic. Question? Yes. Because it's a very tough community. Uh, in terms of belief in this old adage. They wouldn't have brought him in here if he didn't do something. Now, bear in mind, as I said, Cincinnati's a tough town. Mapplethorpe got picked up there. Larry Flint got tried there until he got shot up so bad they got tired of trying him. And they're just a determined... Uh, and, and it sometimes depends on who is running the prosecutor's office and what his attitude is. Phoenix, I defended the chairman of the Navajo tribe in Phoenix. Phoenix is not pleased with the Navajo Indians. First of all, they own more land than the Anglos do in Arizona, uh, and they aren't pleased about that. And second, uh, the chairman of the Navajo tribe got the Democratic vote out and elected Dennis DeConcini, and Barry Goldwater thought that was a felony. Uh, and, and disagreeing with Barry Goldwater in Phoenix was a felony. You could get tried for that. They usually named a statute, but that's what you really had done. And I decided then and there, if I could advise my clients and where they should be apprehended after the commission of some imagined or real crime, that Phoenix was a place to be avoided. And I've added Cincinnati, we've tried a few cases, and Indianapolis the same, uh, Fort Wayne worse, by the way, to that list. Now, Fort Wayne is a, is a town in Indiana that drips with the milk of human kindness. I was uh, defending a poor chap there who had been wrongfully accused of mail fraud by the federal government, uh, one of the strongest cases I've ever seen, however. And uh, I was set to give my opening statement. And a marshal came up to me and gave me a note. And I said to Judge Jesse Eshbaugh, now in the Seventh Circuit, Your Honor, my hotel is on fire, the elevators are not working, and my wife is on the twelfth floor. Could I have a brief recess? so that I could go look to her safety. Motion denied. Make your opening statement. That is as close as I have ever come in my life to saying fuck you to a federal judge. I simply walked out. Just walked out. Said, hold me in contempt, you bastard. Let's go to the circuit and see what happens. Now, that kind of outrage would not have happened in Massachusetts, we like to think. <laughs> but then we had Webster Fair, and if you like the Sacco and Vanzetti case, you'll want to read all about Webster Thayer, who might have told me, make your opening statement, God knows. Question. Yes. Uh, Massachusetts, uh, you have to have a prior court order before you record, uh, before an individual records conversation. Is that correct? Before There are all kinds of state statutes. Um, my partner, Ken Fishman, who was with me tonight, can probably give you a better answer on the current law in Massachusetts. The toughest state that I know of is Florida. It is a felony to record a conversation even with the permission of one participant. Based on your investigation from the cameras in the courtroom, what do you think about should this evidence be admitted without the prior court? Should there be able to be recorded? You know, it's, it's like wiretapping. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes said it's a dirty business, and it is. 
Does it promote truth? You bet. You, you, you can't lie about what's recorded. Then the federal government wins most of its cases now on secret recordings. I mean, look at the Gotti case. People are going to go to sleep in that case listening to how many hundred hours of tapes of people sitting around boasting at the social club about who they killed last week. But uh, uh, almost all federal cases now, at least in drug cases and conspiracies and any kind of violent crime, are, are a bunch of Kel transmitters or wire recorders tucked under the left breast or wherever you can conceal one, and they play on for hours. The problem is, uh, I have never found a way, uh, nor has my more distinguished uh, partner, Mr. Fishman, found a way to cross-examine a tape recording. You're absolutely screwed to the wall. You can't do anything about it. There's your client's voice saying, I'm guilty as hell, and I have no idea a jury will ever hear this, but of course they do. Is it a good idea? That is a, a cultural question. Um, I suppose it revolves around the right to lie. There is a right to lie. It's an important right when you walk in and find your grandmother, uh, you know, on, on, on her deathbed with one foot in the grave and the other in a banana peel. Are you, are you required to stand there and say, look, you look awful and you probably won't last the night? Of course not. You bring flowers and drink, say words of encouragement that you don't even begin to believe. You say nice things to your professors when you'd like to say uh, something different based on the last grade they gave you and so on down the line. Is there a right to lie about an important matter in court? I doubt it. I doubt it. Are you victimized if somebody hands you a tape recording of your own words to impeach your false testimony in the witness stand? Maybe in an extreme case, but I doubt it. Is it a dirty business? You bet. A really dirty business. And the reason we tolerate it is because we believe it's only used on dirty people. And that's okay. You know, the notion that a means justifies, or the end justifies the means in this country is still alive and well, and it's particularly healthy in the last two administrations, which have a, a rather harsh view of what due process really means. Appealing as those views may be, one should always come back to the old principle that the treason that created this country, and believe me, by any human standard, the American Revolution was treason of the most classic kind. If you take a look at the definition of treason in the U.S. Constitution, it is made impossible to prove. Why was that done? Because all the people who wrote the Constitution thought if they lost the war, they'd be tried for treason. And if their rule prevailed, they couldn't be convicted simply because they'd written the rule. Nonetheless, from little incursions like that that seem a handy way to get a bad guy, uh, whole barriers of individual rights are ultimately not ripped down, but eroded. And that's why the ACLU and others stand the line on what appear to be unpopular causes without much compelling logic behind them, because they don't want to see the barriers erode. And, and although I'm just as angry at the guy who victimizes me or my family as any other Archie Bunker in the country, I believe, after 40 years of knocking around in the courtroom, that that's a good idea, that uh, all the Harvard students who won't let the government inch up on their rights and other students are well positioned doing the right thing. Well, the reason I asked, I, I worked in the police for 12 years, and I worked undercover, and I worked in the electronic surveillance, mm -hmm. and uh, I found that I protected a lot of innocent people. Sure. I wouldn't trust these informants. When they go in to make a drug deal, or they're, they're going to make a, a deal for a murder or whatever, Recall what was said. And the other way, he's not recalling it. He, 